All right. Well, I want to, Dr. Sonic, if you're ready, I would just want to be respectful of everybody's time, especially those who, who jumped on right at six. So um, with that, I'll just go ahead and, and get it started. Um, thank you for jumping on if you're on the call this evening. Uh, if I've had the chance to meet you, great to, great to see you again. If I haven't, please come stop by our booth at the AAP. Um, I will have our world famous bio exclude socks there. Um, and again, my name is Matt Burns. I'm one of the directors at Snowasis Medical. A uh, couple quick announcements before we uh, before we get get rolling here. Uh, Perio resident best case competition. Those submissions are due on Sunday the fifteenth. So looking forward to announcing the winners at the upcoming AAP. Uh, if you're going to be at the AAP, also I've got four corporate forums back to back to back to back on that Thursday. Um, I've got a, a pretty cool lineup of speakers. I'm doing actually a panel for all four of the corporate forums with Matt Fine, Israel Putterman, Curry Levitt, Brad Ross, and John Kim. So um, should be a should be a pretty dynamic corporate forum we have set up there. Uh, but with that, you didn't like I said before, you didn't come to hear me. <laughs> so I want to turn this over to Dr. Dr. Michael Sonic. It's it's my pleasure really to to be able to introduce him this evening. Um, I've had the the honor of getting to know him over the last few years, and uh, we have a lot in common when it comes to hospitality. So what he's going to talk about tonight resonates very well with me. Um, that's my background. But uh, Dr. Sonic, dental school at UConn, Perio at Emory, implants at Harvard, um, internationally known for his expertise in the field of periodontics. Uh, lectures again at NYU and UConn. I could go on and on with his with his accolades, but I want to I want to give him the time to to do his presentation. So Dr. Sonic, I'll turn it over to you. Well thank you, Matt. Um can they see me lecturing or just my screen? They can see your screen and, and your and you lecturing is both. Okay. So Matt, thank you for a nice introduction and it's a pleasure to work with you. Uh, you are one of the nicest guys in the business. You're just one of the nicest guys I know. You're always very hospitable, and you and your company epitomize all the things that I'm going to be talking about in the next hour. Uh, so my topic is treating people, not patients, which is the name of uh, my book. Um, and, and I'll give you all, I'm going to give you two, there'll be two opportunities for you to take a picture of the screen. One will be to get the first chapter, both in audio and in video. And the second one will be to get the first uh, video of my course. And I have a video of courses on, on this as well. So my topic today is treating people, not patients. I'm a full-time practicing periodontist in Fairfield, Connecticut, and I've been there for close to 40 years. I graduated dental school in 1979 before, before the internet, and certainly before Instagram and doing all the things that we're doing today, including Zoom meetings. So what I'm gonna do today is take you through my journey to where I am today in treating people, not patients, and what that means. It's basically about treating people nicely. It's about being nice to people. And that's my lecture. Just be nice to people. And that's the whole lecture. If you can do that and you do that well, you'll be very successful. <laughs> um, people, my patience is my new logo. And what I would love to do, my moonshot, which I which I have, I want to do something very special with this. And I've been wanting to do this for about five or six years. I'd like to get this book into every medical and dental school and healthcare facility in the country so that people are you know, that to treat us and take care of us and do all the good medical and dental care. Also know that the hospitality part is very important because it helps you heal better. And this is something that's not taught in dental schools. It's not taught in residencies, unless you're in one of my residency programs. We just don't talk about this. We talk about the procedures, about doing growing bone, about growing bone into proximally, about taking out teeth, about doing implants, about doing Invisalign, by making dentures, et cetera. But today it's more important to be excellent because that's the new baseline is you don't want to be good. And there's books out, there's plenty of books out about that, like good to great and others. But excellence is really the new baseline. There's a book in hospitality called Unreasonable, uh, which I'll share with you later, which is by Will Gadera, who is the owner of 11 Madison Park. And I'll talk to you about how it's important in the restaurant business to take it to that level. And basically, I'm going to be talking about dentistry, but it's through the eyes of someone who's worked in the restaurant business, because my practice is modeled after working in a restaurant. Now, if we look at this next slide, you'll see a young, healthy guy with pink, stippled gingiva. It looks very good. And this is, of course, what we like to see. This is ideal health. And so in my mind's eye and, and all of you periodontal residents out there, you love this. 
And it's very hard to attain this. What I'd like to be able to do is to preserve this with the patients we treat. So this is what I think of as an ideal case. But we're not going to really be talking about the dentistry too much, except to make a couple of points. So this is my book. And my book has been endorsed by about 170 people in the healthcare business. I have dentists that have endorsed it. I have uh, heads of departments of, phys uh, of medicine that have endorsed it, the head of dermatology at Yale. I have the head of, uh, um, I had a the head of joint surgery at the Hospital for Special Surgery. And I'm, pr I'm very, very, very proud of these two endorsements, which are my mentors. Now, if you look up there, some of you may know the person on the right, but I doubt if many of you know the person on the left. Person on the right is my mentor, Dennis Tarnow, who I trained with, or I trained under in 1984 when I first started treating uh, people at, at NYU. So I got out of my residency in 1983, and I immediately came back from Atlanta and went to Fairfield, Connecticut, and I started practicing in Fairfield. And then I went to New York, NYU, where Dennis was a young 37-year-old uh, teacher. And he just had something very special. And uh, what he said and how he practiced was very similar to the way I wanted to practice. Now, of course, he's a great clinician, but a lot of you may not know that he's also a great human being. And what he talked about is that we're not just doing procedures, we're also treating pay people. And I watched him on the clinic floor and I watched how he treated people and he really treated them really nicely. He never said anything negative about anybody. He never criticized the dentistry. He was just concerned about the person that was in his chair. My other mentor is one that you may not know is Danny Meyer. Now, Danny Meyer is known in New York City as a great restaurateur. He started with the Union Square Cafe in 1985, the same year I opened my practice, opened up the Gramercy Tavern, which is a top restaurant in New York. He owned 11, 11 Madison Park for some time, which was the top restaurant in the world. And you may know him from Shake Shack. He also owned Shake Shack. And um, he's become a billionaire with, with, with Shake Shack. He was a very successful restaurateur with the other ones. But what he did was he brought something called enlightened hospitality to the restaurant business. He served great food, but he also gave great service. And I'm very proud that on the cover of my book, he endorsed me. And I have his endorsement right here. This is one of um, the most, most um, rarefied endorsements I've gotten. Because what he says is that hospitality gifts make people feel better. Now, I'll give you another quote at the end of this lecture about how it's important. It's not how we treat the patients, not, not the procedures. So it's serving food or whether we're doing dentistry, it's really more importantly about how do we make people feel? How do we make our patients feel when they're in our practice? So on this next slide here, you can take a picture of this. On the left, you can get the first chapter in PDF, and on the right, you can get the first chapter in audio. So feel free to take out your camera and take a picture of that. And I'll give you a second to do that. And if you can't find that, you can go to my website and you can get it there as well. So this is free on my website. So I'm going to move on and I'll give you another opportunity at the end of the lecture to take another photograph. Now, these are also very important people to me. This is my team. This is the team that I work with. And I have 25 people in my practice and I have two partners, Dr. Ku, Sujin Ku, who went to Harvard and uh, she's from Korea and Dr. Ray Ma, who did his residency at Stony Brook and he's from mainland China. We speak eight languages in our office and I couldn't do what I do unless I was working with this team. And that's not our topic today, team building, but it's a very important topic and is real important. As, as those of you know, who are working in residency programs with staffing and everything else, so oftentimes you don't build that team. You have to work with the team that's there. And that becomes difficult sometimes. My practice, I built my team. And so I'm in private practice so I can do that. So I'm gonna ask you a question. And I don't know if you've thought much about this. Why do you do what you do? You know, what is your purpose? Why are you becoming a periodontist? Do you love doing gingival grafting? Is that what you like to do? Do you want to be able to cover roots like this? Uh, or do you want to regenerate bone as I did here? And, and uh, this is a vertical defect, as you can see. And if we took this tooth out, we'd have a big aesthetic problem. And you can see what the defect looks like. We remove the calculus. We treat it with some tetracycline, place a bone graft. And in this case, I use a bioexclude membrane and here we are at six months with increased regeneration of bone. This case is now out there about seven years. So you do this to regenerate bone. Now, I did do this to regenerate bone, but I also did it to improve the quality of this patient's life. What about this patient, a recovering bulimic, you know, who's worn her teeth and, you know, with, with combination of grinding, clenching, and acid reflux led to a loss of a tremendous amount of enamel. She aesthetically feels terrible. Or this woman here, she feels bad about who she is. She has very poor self-esteem. I'll show you her case in a few minutes. She happens to be a lawyer, uh, graduated from University of Virginia, one of the top 10 law schools in the country. And she's walking around like this because of the poor care. 
Now, this gentleman here, I, I love this guy. His name is Frank Keller. And I'll show you his video in a second. And this is what he looked like when I met him. And his teeth were decayed. He was about 72 years old at the age that, I walked, that I, he walked into my office. He didn't talk much because he felt very bad about who he was. And plus, he's shy to begin with. He's a retired carpenter, and he wanted his teeth fixed. He was in pain. He couldn't eat. His teeth were basically fractured off at the gum line. And to change him like this, which we could do in about six months with the help of a prosthodontist and doing some implant reconstruction, he felt better. So I'm going to share, share with you a one-minute video, and we'll hear what he has to say. And just listen to Frank. Hi, my name is Frank Keller. I came to see Dr. Sonic because my teeth were horrible and I couldn't smile. I learned how to hide my teeth when I did smile. And I had a lot of work done, had a lot of anxiety beforehand, which Dr. Sonic helped me get through. And now I could smile and eat whatever I want, which I couldn't do before. And you know, I highly recommend Dr. Sonic and uh, everybody here was great. So come in and see him and smile. So that's why I go to work every day. I mean, I, yeah, I do implants, I do bone grafts, I do gingival grafting, I do all sorts of procedures, you know, but why I go to work is to improve the quality of patients' lives. I'm going to share with you another patient. Her name is Carol. And I'm going to share with you her story in a second. But first, I'm going to show you a little bit of bone regeneration. This is her before treatment. This is her after treatment. And I didn't know Carol very well. Now, every now and then, a patient will come in, and they're that perfect patient. So I'm going to ask you, what's a perfect patient? They show up on time. They do what you say that you want them to do. And they appreciate it. And they paid her bills. So this is, a, this is a perfect woman. She comes in. She does what I say. She doesn't complain about anything. She pays the bills. There's no conversation. You know, it's a perfect customer. You know, right, Matt? You know, they come in and say, yeah, I don't care what it costs. Just, you know, just load me up. And, you know, because I respect the quality of what you do. And she did. But I didn't know that. I knew nothing about this woman because she was very quiet. And I didn't know anything about her until I saw her video, which I'll share with you in a second. I'm going to quickly go through her case because you're residents. I know you like to see this kind of stuff. So we have a knife edge reg. We did, we did a bone graft. We did some regeneration. In this case, some human pericardium. Closed that area up. And in eight months, we regenerated the bone. Okay. So um, this is not a clinical lecture. I'm just showing you what she went through. And we increased the bone uh, width by about five or six millimeters. And we were able to place a five millimeter diameter implant in the area. And we restored her. So this is her at the end of the restoration. This took us about you know, nine months, 10 months, well, maybe longer than that because I had to wait for the bone to regenerate. Probably took us almost a year to regenerate the bone to get the implant to an ideal position. So at the end of treatment, oftentimes we do these videos. So I'm going to list, let you listen to Carol's video. And I want to ask you three questions. If you have a pen and a paper here, you might want to write down some notes in front of you. I know you won't because nobody writes anymore. This, by the way, is a pen. Okay, for those of you who are, don't have never used one, because right now we don't use pen and paper too much anymore. It's like, does anyone have a pen? Yeah, you know, almost nobody does. We do everything texting or, or we, you know, we type or we, or we dictate. So, but take a few minutes to think about how does she make you feel after you listen to her video? You saw what she went through. Did you learn anything from it? And are there any changes you might make in your practice because of what Carol said? This video is 98 seconds. Okay, so here we go. Hi, I'm Carol, and I've been with Dr. Sonic for the last couple of years. As a child, um, my teeth were not taken care of properly. I'm from a, a third world country, basically, where they pull teeth when, when something is wrong. So I went for many years with spaces in my teeth, especially in my back teeth. They were gone. It was very painful. I couldn't chew. I didn't really uh, smile that much. And I decided that, you know what, enough is enough that I'm going to have this taken care of. So I was recommended to Dr. Sonic, who did a great job. He grew the bone and he put the implants in. The procedure was pain-free. Um, now I can chew things again. It's, it's good to be able to chew, to be able to smile. I feel like a complete person. Um, Dr. Sonic and his staff are awesome. You know, when I was going through the process, it was like a day at the spa. They, I had a nice warm blanket. They gave me um, music. It was, it was wonderful. 
And even though when you're going through this stuff, it doesn't hurt. But even after I woke up, I have no pain. They were very nice. They called me that night. They called me the next day to see how I was doing. And I really appreciate that. And I would highly recommend them. As someone, I've been through many dances and many surgeons. There's a lot of stuff going on in my mouth. And they are definitely number one on my list. So what was interesting about this video, and oftentimes we'll take a video after uh, we do a procedure. And if you're not doing this a suggestion, and what I'll do is I'll stop every now and then. And I'll give you a, a tip, a clinical tip. That's uh, a practice management tip. Pull out your iPhone at the end of treatment, just grab it, and then get a big black piece of cloth. Just have it in your operatory and have someone hold it behind the patient. And it looks pretty professional. Or you can use white. And then just take a quick iPhone video and you'll learn a lot. I actually take a lot before treatment. I'll, when a patient comes in, they're very apprehensive. I'll take a quick video, see what they're like, and then I'll take one after. It's very interesting because they change. And what they change is they no longer have fear. They start to trust you. And with Carol, I didn't take a video before. I hardly knew her. When she said third world country, I'm thinking like, I didn't know where she was from a third world country. I thought she was from Bridgeport, Connecticut. I didn't even know what country she was from. She it turns out she's from Jamaica. And uh, after the video, I started talking to her. We became friendly and I ended up treating her whole family. She said to the rest of her family at that time. I did not talk to her, but she just was very quiet. And she was such a good patient. I didn't have to manage her. Sometimes you have to talk to patients. She, she was cool. Now, I did not know her experience was that good because she never complained. She never said anything positive. She just was that good patient. And, you know, it's like when you're not having any complications, everything's going smoothly. When do you know there's a problem? When there's a complication? That's, that's another topic, but we'll talk about that. Maybe if we have time during the question and answer period, I want you to ask me about complications. So what did she have to say? So she said a lot. She said all this in 98 seconds. That's a lot of material. I'll just highlight a couple of things. You know, teeth were pulled. Something was wrong. She was in pain. She couldn't chew, but she's now pain-free. Now she can chew again. She was pain-free during the treatment, pain-free after the treatment. She was very, very, very pleased because it was all about pain and she never had pain. Now she lost that tooth as a young girl in Jamaica and they was pulled out without very good anesthesia as a lot of poor people uh, have things done to them. They can't control it and children can't control what's done to them in a dental or medical office. They're sort of like victims. And oftentimes we are too. If you have a severe accident, you're brought, you're brought by an ambulance to the hospital as a close friend of mine had last week who went over at handlebars of his bike and he happens to be a physician. He had no control over what was done. He was at the mercy, you know, or, or the goodwill of the people taking care of him. And he just got to the ICU after six days and he's doing well now, but he just happened to great, get really great care. He was fortunate. This woman did not get great care as a kid and hopefully we've given her some good care. So what really was the message? And if we're all in the same room together, I'd love to have this conversation, but I'll get right to the point. The message was she felt safe and cared for. And isn't that what we all want? Don't we always want to feel safe and cared for? We want to be loved. We want to be taken care of. We want to be certain that the outcome is right. Do we always make our patients safe and cared for? And I will, I will posit for you that we don't. And I'm not saying you all don't. I didn't. When I was a young guy and I was start getting in my residency, I just want to be a surgeon. You know, I'm here. I'm Dr. Sonic. I, could, I do great gingival grafts. OK, I do great bone grafts. I do great flap surgery because that's what we we're doing. And we didn't do bone grafts back in the 70s and 80s. We were just trying to save teeth with scaling and flap surgery. So I felt really like I was a surgeon. That's how I defined myself. That's changed over the course of my career. And one of the things that's changed is that I now take better care of my patients. And that phone call after treatment is really important. So number one, take videos. Number two, make the post-op phone call. Have your staff or your assistant do it the day one, or you do it. And day two, call them again, because day one, they're not in pain. If they get that phone call, they feel a lot better. Now, let me tell you something. You all think surgery is routine because you do it every day, but you don't have it done to you every day. Now, I'm a dental patient, which I'll share with you in a moment. But patients don't go through the procedures every day. For us, it's no big deal to take out teeth. I take, you know, I do four to five, six surgical procedures on a daily basis. So it's no big deal. And I've been doing that for 40 years. So I've done thousands of surgeries. It's not an exciting day for me to do the surgery. I don't not, I don't not get a good night's sleep. I don't even look at my schedule. It's already taken care of. I walk in and go, oh, we're doing this today. I'm doing this today. It's routine for us. It is not routine for patients. It's the biggest day of their lives for a lot of them. So when you make that phone call, you alleviate their fears and their anxieties. And as a patient myself, I've had hand surgery. I've had multiple dental procedures. I've had other procedures done. 
If we had more time, I could talk about those bad experiences I had where a phone call would have made the difference. Matter of fact, after one procedure, I thought that I had something wrong with me, you know, and I, th I, and I thought I was given a death sentence because the doctor never called me. And for three days, I thought I was going to die. This was about 25 years ago. On Monday, when the office opened, I, they called me, I called them up. I go, am I okay? They go, yeah, you're fine. But all weekend, I thought I was going to die because I had no knowledge. I had no certainty. So give your patients a call the night of and the next day. Tony Robbins, who all of us knows, talks about basic human needs and spiritual human needs. And whether you like Tony Robbins or don't, he's certainly one of the most, most, most significant thought leaders in the world. And he's, he's a, basically the professor of neuro-linguistic programming, which is how we, how we communicate with each other. I, I would take two of these needs, and I would say certainty and love and connection are what we need to do for our patients. We need to make them feel certain that they're in the right place. And by the way, write this down too. On my first visit, I always say to a patient, you are in the right place, okay? They don't know if they're in the right place. They have no idea. They don't know if you know what you're doing or don't, or you're gonna take good care of them. When I tell them that, they feel better, okay? And it's also important for them to feel loved and connected because the most things, okay, they don't really care about the gingival graft or the, or the bone graft. They, they assume that they need it and it's gonna make things better. But really what they wanna feel is they wanna feel loved and connected to. They wanna feel that the person that they're with is taking good care of them. And so the best things in life are not things. The best things in life are things you can't buy. What can't you buy that you really need? There are really two things. I was talking to somebody about this today. There are two things in life you cannot buy. You can't buy time and you can't buy health. You can do some things to get some more time, but if you're like you know unhealthy and you're 80 and you're a billionaire, I'm sorry, you're out of time and you're out of health. You can't, those are not, those are not things you can buy. But the experiences. Those are things that people really want. They want the experience of having time and being healthy. And Daryl Kane, who's the founder of Kane Waters, an investment advisory firm in, in uh, Texas, says that you have to care more about the value of the service you provide than the money you receive. You have to care more about the value of the service you provide. So basically, we are in a service business, aren't we? Or are we in a tooth business? How do you define yourself? And there are a bunch of things that we can do to talk about that. I'd love to have conversations with you. How do you define yourself? How do you look at yourself? I mean, you know, I know Matt. I can't see anybody else here, but I know Matt well. I don't think Matt defines himself by how many membranes did he sell this month. Now, he wants to sell a lot because he'll make more money, but that's not how he does it. He never says, I hope you buy more this month. I hope you buy more. I'll give you 20% off. That's not how he does it. He does it by connecting strongly with other human beings. And he's that kind of a guy. And you are attracted to people that are giving. And I remember when uh, implants first came out, there was this one implant company I was working with. They had the, quote, best implant, but their service was terrible. I left them for another company because I got better service. Now, that company doesn't give very good service because it was bought by another company. It was bought by another company. So I'm looking for an implant company that gives great service. And there aren't too many of them now because they've gotten big and they've gotten very corporate. But I love getting that great service you know, from those companies because it made me feel cared about. It made me feel heard maybe feel important, maybe feel valued. And I thought that they would do the right thing for me. Basically, all implants work fairly similarly. It doesn't really matter what implant you use. I mean, there are many companies out there that all work with the same success rate. So let me talk to you about the golden circle. I don't know if you've ever heard about this or seen this, but a lot of people have. If you haven't seen Simon Sinek's TED Talk, you are probably in the minority in this country, okay? It's been viewed 133 million times. It's the third most watched TED Talk in the world. He talks about the golden circle and he talks about your why. Now he talks about the what, the how, and the why. So what do you do? I'm a dentist, I fill teeth. How do you do it? I went to dental school. I learned how to prep teeth and do now class two restorations. Why do I do it? And that's different. So what we do is the same. We all do the same thing. We all place implants, do gingival grafting, you know, treat periodontal disease. And we, we all do it fairly similarly. There's some fairly, you know, some little nuances, but most of the time it's the same. But why do we do it? What is your why? Why do you do it? And when I talk to residents, you know what the why is? I love doing surgery. But as a residency, that's what you, what you like to do. You like to do surgery and you're really excited about it. Well, quite honestly, I don't really like surgery that much anymore. I've been doing it for 40 years. I've done, you know, 15,000 implants. I don't know how many extractions I've done, 40, 50,000 of those. It's not that exciting. But you know what's exciting? Connecting with the other human beings, connecting with the patients that are in my chair. This is my why right here. My why is taking, I'm sorry, my why is taking these people at the top of the screen and turning them into the people on the bottom of the screen. The only thing I did to these patients is fix their teeth 
but that each of these patients has a story. And I can go on for about 30 to 40 minutes on every one of these patients here. A refugee from Vietnam, the lawyer that I showed you earlier from UVA, an overweight, insecure kid that got a scholarship to Cornell and had to come home because he was homesick. We fixed his teeth and graduated Val Victorian from the local high school, became a PhD and now works Got a PhD from Yale, and now, now is a full professor at Fairfield University. A phlebotomist that really was very poor, didn't do well because she had no self-esteem. Now a happily married woman. Okay, a guy in the fashion industry, a woman that had terrible experiences with her front teeth. And for 10, 10 to 15 years, multiple surgeries. We took out the tooth and an implant, and here she is 25 years later. I want a facelift. Now let's just fix your teeth. I'm not going to smile. Smiles a little bit more now. He's in pain here. Every one of those patients has a story. It's important that you also tell your story to the patients. If you want to influence people, connect with them by telling a story. Don't tell them facts. Don't talk about pocket depth. Don't talk about bone grafting. Don't talk about occlusion. Don't talk about balancing contacts. Talk about a story. And what's really great you could do, if you have a story, you might be able to connect with your patients as I do. Now I'm gonna share with you my story. This is me as a young boy. And here I am at age eight, after my bike accident, I went over the handlebars of my bike at age eight. I knocked out my central incisors. They were wired back in by a local oral surgeon, Dr. Aronson, who did a beautiful job. And I went through high school. Here I am at 15 with two broken front teeth because they didn't give me crowns. From the age of eight until 18, I had two brown little stubs here for front teeth. And I was nicknamed broken teeth and whatever, you know, and people made fun of me. And I could care less. Okay. So it helped my self-esteem because I got used to, you know, used to that. And that's just was normal for me because in the sixties, nobody was doing crowns on kids or bonding up teeth. They didn't even have bonding back then. There were only two endodontists in the state of Connecticut in 1966. And one was an hour and a half away and one was an hour away. So I tried an hour to have these root canals done. It was a, it was an interesting time very early on. And I went on, they had 23 crowns, I've lost nine teeth, and here I am at 46. I have a couple of endos. This, these endos were done when I was eight. They're still in my mouth, but then I fractured the front teeth off, knocked them down. This is me, by the way, gingivitis, just, you know, periodontists don't floss. And um, yeah, I, I ended up losing this tooth. And I ended up losing that tooth and I had a full mouth rehabilitation because I ground my teeth down. They were in terrible shape. I had TMJ problems. And here I am at age 47 with 23 crowns, lost nine teeth. So this is my mouth. All right. So when a patient comes in and talks to me about their mouth, I say, okay, well, I have 23 crowns. And I go like this. And they go, your teeth look great. I go, yeah, because they're all fake. Like it's the only plastic surgery I've had, but I got 23 fake teeth. And they go, really? I go, yeah, hours in the dental chair, four hour visits, you know, every other week for like two months. And, you know, and then I fractured the bridge in a bike accident. So I'll tell you about that in a second. So here I am, you know, after I fractured the tooth at 46, here I am 18 years later with my wife in New Zealand. And here's my daughter, Becky, the day she graduated from University of Texas, San Antonio School of Dentistry. She's now a dentist in town. So that went really well up until two years ago. So two years ago, my son and I are going out for a bike ride. My wife goes, don't ride. I go, why? She goes, this, this, there was a storm. There were trees down, power wires. Well, I'm a bit of a daredevil. So I said to my wife, I go, let's go out to my son. She goes, don't take him out there. I go, we're fine. So we go out for a ride. And she was right. We're going down a hill. My son, who was at the time about 25, no, he was about 29. He went off his bike, got road rash. His whole body, side of his body is bleeding. He's not hurt. He's just bleeding. So he says, we got to go home, dad. I go, no, we're keeping on going. We're going to keep going. So I go, don't be a baby. You know, and I said a bunch of other stuff that guys say to guys when they're out riding together. And he says, no, no, we should. I said, let's just keep going. Well, God was looking at me and says, okay, you can do this to him. Here's what I'm going to do to you. So I go over a log 15 minutes later and knock out my front teeth. Okay. Actually, they didn't knock out. They were loose. So this is me, 2021. This was after Thanksgiving. So the bike accident was in August. My teeth were loose, but I didn't want to go see a dentist because I didn't want to find out what was happening because I knew what was happening. I knew they had fractured and I knew it was going to be a lot of time in the dental chair. So Saturday, 2021, two days after Thanksgiving, I'm sitting in my, I'm sitting right here behind me in this brown chair. You'll see it in the, in the video. I'm sitting in that brown chair and I bite into a piece of pineapple and my bridge falls out. So this picture was taken right after my bridge fell out. So I have to call up my friend, the dentist. My, my current dentist had retired, my previous one. He had retired to prosthodontist. So I called the new prosthodontist and I said, you know, can you come in and see me? Now he lives an hour and a half from me, but he's a really nice guy and his wife's a prosthodontist. So two prosthodontists come in and see me on a Saturday and they put me back together. 
it took about three hours, you know, to make the temps, to reprep these things and get everything done. But I did record a video of myself before the before the uh, appointment. So teeth come out. I call my friend Min Hyun. I said, meet me in the office. He goes, I'll be there in an hour. And then I pull out my camera. And then this is me. So I'm going to play Hello, my video. Everyone. It's uh, Dr. Mike Sonic here. And uh, as many of you may or may not know, I've had a full amount of rehabilitation done over 20 years ago uh, by my good friend, Dr. Steve Rothenberg, who recently retired. And as I bit into a piece of pineapple this morning, making my shake, I crashed into my front bridge. Fortunately for me, I have a good dentist, a good dental friend uh, who has taken over the reins from Dr. Steve Rothenberg, Dr. Min Yoon, and he'll be seeing me today in about an hour. One of the perks of being a dentist, I do know some people in the field, but I also suffer like many of you do from dental disease. I've lost nine teeth, I have 23 crowns, I've been a dental patient since I've been eight years old since I had my first accident. So I can relate when those of you tell me you have dental problems. I probably have more dental problems than most of my patients, but at least I know where to go to get them fixed. So just wanted to share that with you all. Hope you're doing well. Bye-bye. That's a powerful story. Now, you all don't have that story, but you do have other stories. My partner, Ray Ma, went to periodontal school residency because he had some periodontal disease. He was the fourth generation dentist from China. That's the story he now tells. I didn't start telling the story until I was in my late 40s. I missed you know, 20 years of an opportunity. When I tell that story to a patient, they can relate to it, okay? And it makes me more sensitive in their eyes to what they're Hello, going everyone. through. And this is me, you know, I, had a, I have crown lengthening. I, uh, there was not enough bone here for an implant. And, you know, I went through went through a lot, of, a lot of pain and suffering with this. And this was just a couple of years ago. I'm fixed now and everything's back to normal. So what is your story? I would create a story if you haven't and create a story that you're comfortable telling. And what happens after a period of time is you got a whole library of stories and you keep on pulling them out. Now I've been around for 70 years, so I have a lot big library and I could talk and talk and talk, but I didn't know all this stuff until I wrote the book and started to realize, you know, what I've gone through and how did I get here? So start to be practical about this and practice, 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 you know? And uh, the old joke is how to get to Carnegie Hall, practice, practice, practice. How do you become a good storyteller? Practice, practice talking to your patients, relating to them. Now, a lot of you don't like to do that because the personality profile of a dentist is someone who really likes to work with their hands in a small area and are very detail oriented. So most dentists are not naturally great storytellers, but some of you are, but everyone could be. My partner, Raymond, is not a natural storyteller, but you wouldn't know that if you saw him in the office today. He is so smooth. I mean, when before he used to lecture 10 years ago, he would practice in front of the mirror for like to give a 20 minute lecture. He'd practice for three or four days. Then he'd get up. Now he just can get up and we do videos together. And he's and he's, he's, he's gotten very good at it because he got comfortable. But that takes time. You know, I was not this comfortable when I was younger. It took many years. So let me share with you another patient. This is uh, Dee Dee. And she is the lawyer. She's also a Navy Jag. And this is what she looked like when I met her. And she came into my office uh, 30 years after she graduated from college. And this is what her mouth looks like. So I'm showing a little dentistry just to wake you up a bit. So here she is. She's got three implants placed by two different surgeons, both periodontists. She has periodontal disease. She has posterior bite collapse. She has actually anterior bite collapse. She's got over, she's overclosed. You know, the plane of occlusion on the posterior teeth is below you know, the plane of occlusion on the um, on the mandibular teeth, and she's got a jaw within a jaw situation. It's terrible. It's like a telescope. And, you know, Charles Barkley, not Charles Barkley, Robert Barkley, Charles Barkley is the basketball player, but Robert Barkley, a dentist who passed away in the 70s, you know, said tongue in cheek, the goal of dentistry is to make patients worse at the slowest possible rate. Now, this was back in the days of, you know, amalgams and, you know, gold foils and things. But people got worse when they had more dentistry done because they weren't doing preventative work. And we're periodontists and hopefully we do that. And uh, I do a weekly blog on one aspect of what we, we do in our office. And to this, this week's blog was on the importance of placing patients on a maintenance program, which a lot of periodontists don't do because they don't have, peri they don't have hygienists and because they just want to do implants. But it's important that we make patients better. And this patient, listen to her, look, I mean, her dentistry has resulted in this. If she never had any dentistry, she'd have most of her teeth, okay? Because she doesn't have periodontal disease. And I doubt I mean, all these teeth were caries. This tooth here has not had any dentistry. It's fine, it doesn't even have any recession. And she's in, you know, in her late 60s. Well, anyway, we put her through a significant amount of treatment after talking with her. And that's not the point of this lecture, but we did immediate load on the bottom, sinus grafts, and you know, here she is at the completion of care. And she looks like here to here. Now, 
how did I get her to go in that from here to here? She's been seeing the dentist her entire life. She, but it's, when I saw her, she was consulting with dentists in California, with Louisiana, New York City. She didn't trust anybody because she had a very bad relationship with the dentist that treated her. Now, Atal Gawande, who some of you may know, I don't know if you know him or not, he wrote the book, The Checklist Manifesto, but his recent book, which was published in 2014, is called Being Mortal. Now, Atal Gawande is a physician. He's a Harvard-trained physician, and he is probably one of the most significant thought leaders in medicine today. He's an excellent physician, but he's also an excellent thinker. He writes for The New Yorker. At one point in time, he was um, head of a consortium that was involved uh, James Diamond, Jeff Bezos, and uh, Warren Buffett. And he would, they were going to put together, you know, a huge healthcare you know, conglomerate. And he was there for about four or five months, and then he, he quit. He couldn't take it because it was not the way he, 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 he wanted to practice medicine. So if you haven't read the Checklist Manifesto, write that down, read it. I'm sure some of you have, but it will change the way you practice. But he talked about, in this book here, three different types of doctor-patient relationships. And this book is about end of life decisions. So most doctors, when you're having an end of life decision, they really don't talk to you much about, you know, what is going to be the outcome of care. So for an example, his, in this book, he, he talks about his father, who's also an ENT. His father was dying of cancer. And at the end of his father's life, Atal Gawande stopped being a doctor. He became like the son of a patient who was dying and he went along with the doctors. And what they did was they put him on a lot of you know, chemotherapy and the last few months of his life were terrible. It didn't extend his life and it decreased the quality of his life. And he listened to the doctors. What he suggests in this book, and it's also what Robert Bar uh, Barkley talks about, is that get the patient involved in making the treatment decisions. So there are three types of relationships. One is the paternalistic. And that's the old way of doing it. Today, we don't have that much in medicine, but it, it looks something like this. I'm the doctor. You're the patient. This is what I recommend. This is what your choice is. You don't get to make a decision. Now, that doesn't happen as much today as it did 30, 40 years ago, because the doctor is not the big authority figure. But especially for you know the, um, the newer generation, the millennials, they don't want to listen to the, the doctors. But for the you know the boomers and the people older than the boomers, you know like my parents' generation, they just listen to doctors. And then the second phase is the informative. It's the retail relationship. This is how most doctors practice today. You can do an implant, or we could take out the tooth and do a bridge. Uh, you know, it's up to you. The bridge is uh, thirty-five hundred. The implant is five thousand dollars. What do you want to do? They're not really given all the information. And the patient is at a disadvantage because they don't know as much as the doctor does about making a decision, and it makes it hard to make a decision. And the third type of relationship is the one that I recommend that we 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 pair it or or not or posit. It is the interpretive, shared decision making. I'm the doctor, you're the patient. I have knowledge about something you don't know, so let me inform you what your options are and educate you. Once I educate you, then you can make the best decision. Yeah, we can do an implant, but you're going to have to take out the tooth. We're going to be without the tooth for a few months. We have to do a bone graft. The implant success rate is high, but still may not work. You know, there's two surgeries, there's three surgeries. But then once it's done, you can floss between it. We don't touch the adjacent teeth. You know, we go through all, the, all those decision-making processes. And I think it's an important way to, to do that with your patient so that you and your patient make the decision together. We had a study club last night. And I had a really severely involved patient. You know, we ended up doing full mouth rehabilitation on the patient. But I'm showing the initial pictures. And it's the dentist got so hot, not all of them, there were like 30 people there, but four of them got so hot looking at the case. They go, no, the patient doesn't get to make the decision. They sometimes can't get what they want. And that's totally against what I feel. I think patients should get exactly what they want and they should be involved in making the decision. It's not always the right decision, but they have to have all the information necessary so they can make the correct decision. Now, that patient I showed you, this one here, I'll go back to her for a second. That is Dee. Let me show you her husband. Now, Dee Dee's brilliant, okay? She went to Connecticut College and University of Virginia Law School. Her husband went to MIT and has his own company. This is her husband, and I saw him in the waiting room. And I said to him, I said, I'm not treating your wife until I treat you. He goes, why? I go, I don't want that bacteria in your wife's mouth if she has implants. He goes, well, I don't know. I go, yeah, you're going to do it. So scaling and root planning, five years later, one implant, he's done. So there's an important quote I'm going to share with you. Not, not every patient can afford all that we have to offer, but it's our responsibility to offer everyone the options that are available. And that happens during the initial examination. That initial examination is a most important hour. Now you all do initial exams because you're in a residency program, but most doctors don't. 
What percentage of doctors do comprehensive examination? I would say less than 10%. Most patients come to the, de to the dentist via the dental hygienist. Now, Talgo on these book, The Checklist Manifesto, he talks about having a checklist for everything that we do. Matter of fact, his checklists were brought into Mass General and they decreased post-operative inspections following the insertion of the pick lines because he demanded that the doctors wash their hands before they do it, which they weren't doing until about 30 years ago. So he proved that washing your hands was an important thing, so it's now part of the checklist. So we have a checklist for everything in our office, from the music we play, to the way patients are, are taken through treatment, to what's out during the surgery, et cetera. I must have about 100 checklists. And whenever we have a problem, it's usually because we didn't have a checklist or we weren't following the checklist. We weren't following our protocol. So there's a checklist for everything. As a checklist for when you fly on an airplane. That's where most of these checklists came from. And this is an important checklist, which you all do because you have to, because you're in a residency program. You do an exam, you do a diagnosis. Everybody does that. Then you come up with treatment options and then treatment. This is the treatment checklist. Do most dentists do this? They don't. And you'll be surprised when you're out there in private practice, if you haven't been there already, that most people don't do this. So you look at this patient here. And I'm going to say to you, take a look at this x-rays for a second. I'll keep them up. What's the treatment plan? Now, a lot of you might say, oh, that's all I'm for, because you didn't do a diagnosis, you didn't do an exam, you didn't give treatment options. Some of you might say, well, that we can keep a couple canines and do bridge work, et cetera. But you really, a lot of people just jump to the end. So when I put these x-rays up to one of my study clubs, they're going to say, take the teeth out. They can't be saved. But you don't know anything about the person. And this is the same patient. Okay, this is about seven years later. We did perio. We did. We took out a couple posterior teeth. We did no restorations. We did one connective tissue graft anteriorly. We grafted this with a combination of uh, Puro's bone allograft and and um, and um, bioexplude, which, by the way, is my uh, is my go-to for interproximal grafting. I get phenomenal regeneration uh, with bioexplude and uh, bone grafting material. Here's the patient seven years later. Look at the difference of that bone. It's stable, and he's been doing really well. He's been coming in every three months for seven years, up until a year and a half ago. He's diabetic, and I've called him 10 times, and I sent him a letter. I said, if you don't come back, you lose your teeth, because he will, because he stopped coming in, because he's no longer doing the habit. But it's a major change in the way his teeth are. We improved it, and his A1C went from 8 to about 6.5. So his diabetes is under better control. Now, let me talk to you about the metaphor. A dental practice is like a fine restaurant, okay? That's what I want my patient's practice to be. And there's a, something called Zagat's. It's no longer around, but it used to be a way that we, I don't know if you, a restaurant rating thing. And this was formed by Tina and, um, and um, what's his name? Uh, I can't remember his name. There was that uh, Nina and Tim. Nina and I call him Tina. Tim and Nina Zagat. They went to Yale and they were big foodies. They love to eat. And so they come up with this restaurant rating thing and they started to go out to restaurants. They go, they had their friends send them recommendations of restaurants. And then they created a book and they created a whole big business and they sold it to Google about six years ago. This restaurant rating doesn't exist anymore. However, it exists for me because I look at every restaurant in terms of food, decor, and service, except we don't run a restaurant. We serve dentistry but we still need decor and service. And that is true in any business that you, where you meet people. If someone comes to your place of business, you better have good decor and good service, and then you have to have a good product, all right? So let's talk about food. Well, we don't sell food, so we don't have to talk about that. What do we talk about? Dentistry. This is what we do. This is what we do in practice. This is what we do. We change lives, but we're not gonna talk about this now. But this is the product we serve. Let's talk a little bit about decor. Now, here's the question. Uh, what is the patient's first impression of your office? Okay, so you all don't have offices, you're in residencies, but you can change it, by the way. You know, you don't have complete control. Now, I know you, a lot of you are saying, well, that's easy, he's in private practice, you know, he's been doing this for years, he's able to create his own team. I'm just a resident, you know, I'm in this filthy clinic, working with people that I don't really like, and I don't, I can't fire my assistant, etc. Well, there are some things you can do. And um, I, when I was a, when I was a dental student, uh, this was before we had things called cassettes. Those were little the things that, that went around and you put them into things like little, uh, I forget what, cassette recorders and we played music. And I had 20 different cassettes. I had Willie Nelson. I had like Inya. I had, you know, Grateful Dead. So I had different types of music and I had 20 different types of music. And a patient would come in, I'd offer the music and I bought my own cheap sunglasses. This was before OSHA said you had to wear glasses. And I gave my patients glasses and had a cheap music, and I'd buy a piece of cheap artwork, and I'd put it on the wall there so it looked like they were in a nice office. Now, I didn't own the office. It was, I was a resident, 
And I did the same thing when I worked in the mall. That's a whole different story. I mean, I started as a mall dentist, you know, back in the 80s. But when a patient's first impression there is what? What do you think the patient's first impression is for your practice, for you? Well, it's usually the referral, the referral who brings them in. So before I see a patient, there's 10, 15, 20 different things that that patient has to see before I even meet them. Let me take you through a couple of the things. So before a patient meets me, they have to get a referral. And that's true for you too. Someone has to refer a patient to you. It could be another patient. It could be the clinic. It could be a prosthodontic resident. That's first. Then they're going to go to the website. And they may or may not go to your website, but you're really not up on the website, but your, but your program is. And then they're going to make a phone call. And then they're going to get an email, perhaps. And then they're going to look at the neighborhood. Are you in a good neighborhood? And then they're going to look at your facility. Is it painted? Is it grass green? Is it, is it filled with crabgrass? Do you have garbage all over it? I mean, do you have, you know, is, there, is it clean, neat, nice, you know, dumpsters turned over? Then they're greeted by somebody, usually a receptionist. And then they're going to meet a clinical assistant. So this is the minimum. Before I see any patient, there are eight interactions before I even see the patient. If those interactions are all positive, I'm done. All I got to do is walk in and say, hi, I'm Dr. Sonic. What do you want to do? Whatever you want to do, because I've had a great experience here so far. They set it up for me. Most people go online before they make their first appointment. 77 people go online as a first step. 90% evaluate their docs online and 80% trust reviews. And as you know, how do you know if those reviews are good or bad? You don't. So, but if you have a lot of good ones, that's usually a good sign. And before I make a reservation at a restaurant, I do all these things. Now I do it before I even see a doctor. I go online and it has nothing to do with the doctor. It has everything to do with the staff and the team because nobody's really reviewing the doctor, They're reviewing their experience that they've had. And I can go on and on about this. So this is our, our practice. And we have right now, we have 742 Google reviews, five star. And we have 2,700 five star bird eye reviews right now online. That's amazing. Why do people do that? I don't pay them for it. I don't give them Starbucks cards because we give them an over the top wow experiences. And so there's not many times you get to make that first impression. Now, what about you? How do you make a first impression when you see your patient? Are your nails clean? Is your hair pulled back nicely? Are you clean shaven? Do you wear nice clean clothes? Do you have white sneakers on? All right, those are things that you can do today. You have some control. You can't control everything, but those are some of the things you can do today in your residency program. I have a beautiful office. This is my office building. I bought this office. I spent a lot of money on this office. I gutted the inside. This is what it looks like after I gutted it. I spent a lot of money, seven figures, fit, fit, fitting this place out and making it beautiful. And I'm all done making it. Grass is okay. And the patient comes in and says to me, now this now the patient's name is Rocco, okay? So you can imagine what Rocco looks like. He wears boots, okay? And he doesn't live, it doesn't live in Texas or Colorado. He's in the Northeast, so you're wearing boots there. That, that doesn't make sense. He's got the boots on, he drives a Porsche. His hair is thick, big, blown back. He wears this big gold ram's horn around here. Tight, very, he's a muscular guy, tight clothes, and he married a rich girl. OK, and he's a, quote, builder. So he walks in and he says, I love what you deal with the place. We're talking about the inside. He goes, but it doesn't have any curb appeal. So it's like, bam, a dagger went into my heart. I felt terrible. You know, I spent like a million bucks renovating this place. And he just told me the place had no curb appeal. So what did I do? I got a good gardener and I put in irrigation. It's the same building, same building. Which building would you rather walk into? It's the same building. It's the same practitioner. I do the same surgery here that I do here, but this is inviting. This is not. These are my receptionists. When they walk in, you see these two people with name tags, so you know who they are and they smile at you. You can just tell that they're happy people. We got a picture of Marilyn Monroe here because most of my average age is 68. Most people in the 60s think this is good. So it's important, but let me ask you, are your sneakers clean? Do you wear nice, clean sneakers to the office? Or does it not matter because you're just residents? You just have to come in, you know, I'm just trying to get through this. It doesn't really matter what I look like. Well, your patients will heal better if you have nice, clean sneakers. Now, let me show you something. You'll also do more treatment. This is Mario, all right? Mario here is, he is a um, patient of mine. And he owned this restaurant called Mario's down by the Westport train station. Now in my town, Westport's a very wealthy community. Mario's was the place to eat, okay? But you could come off the train back in the 60s, the 70s, 80s. It was the Mad Men time. And you go into Mario's. Mario sold more alcohol in his restaurant than any other restaurant in Connecticut. So he's a very successful guy. And the reason he's selling a lot of alcohol is because the gin tastes the same there as it does anywhere else. Why? 
because of Mario. He's a connector. He's got 5,000 names in his head. Everyone went there just to shake Mario's hand. You can see he's a nice guy. And he'd sit there all night. He'd have three martinis between the hours of 4.30 and 10.30. He'd nurse them all night, and then he'd go home and go to sleep. And he was a great guy. And he came into my office for treatment. So I'm in practice now like six years. I'm sort of struggling. I have a lot of debt. And Mario walks in. So for this, my community, this is basically royalty because he knows everybody. And if he likes me, he'd send me a lot of patients. So 1997, he walks into the practice. He's looking like this. And this was early on in my immediate implant phase. And I looked at this. I said, I, we could take these out. and Maybe we'll do some immediate load for him. But I wasn't really placing the implants immediately and, and loading them. But maybe I'd place the implants and we put them into a denture. And we, this is a treatment plan. We do a denture, extract the teeth, do a five immediate implants, heal, expose, do a hybrid. So this is his treatment. So Mario walks in and um, he comes in the first time. And he says, I like you. He goes, but I want to come back with my girlfriend. Now, Mario was married to the same woman for 50 years and she died. Now he has a new girlfriend sitting behind her. And he's, she's looking down here because she can't stand me. All right. She's looking down here and she's looking at me up and down and says, I don't like this guy. I can tell. So and I didn't like her either. She was snooty. And then I'm thinking to myself. She's like 30 years younger than Mario. Mario's in his 80s. I said, she's just with him for his money. So, you know, he just lost his wife. Now he's got a girlfriend, 30 years younger, and he doesn't trust me. And she's here to check me out. And so I'm talking to Mario, and this is the second visit. Now, normally I close my first visit. Okay, sometimes for bigger cases, I come back to second. The second visit, if they don't tr book treatment, pretty much they walk out, I'm done. If a patient leaves my office without making a follow-up appointment, I am not going to treat that patient. So Mario left. And I'm and I'm 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 crestfallen. I'm thinking like, oh boy, I just lost a big case. I'm not going to treat him anymore. And um, I thought I'd, hit, I'd never see him again. So he calls me up a few weeks later. He goes, I'd like to see you. Third consultation. So at this time, I don't have any of the skills I have now for treating people, not patients. I really don't understand that. I'm a pretty good surgeon, but I don't know about treating people, not patients. So he comes back. And he goes, I want to go through treatment. I said, okay, great. And like, I'm trying not to show exci how excited I am because it's a big case. He goes, how much is it? And my fee at the time was 9,000. I go, $9,000. He goes, okay. He says, I'd like to pay you half today. I said, we're not starting today. He goes, that's okay. I just want to reserve, reserve my spot and pay half. Meanwhile, my, my practice had plenty of spots. So he pulls out his checkbook because we we're using checks back then. And it's 9,000. So I expect him to write a check for $4,500. So he pulls out a pen. He starts to write. And as he's writing, I see he's, he's writing for 9,000. And he's looking at me. Now, Mario's a very bright guy and he's really good people. And I know what he's doing. He's looking at me to see if I'm really excited about getting a check for $9,000, which I was, okay, because I needed the money. And I didn't have the big office then. I had a small office. So he hands me the check. And I said, Mario, it's 9000 You told me 4500 He goes, I know. And he goes, but I'd like to make an appointment with you. I said, okay. So then I turned to Mario and I said, you know, I'm surprised you're back here. He goes, why is that? I said, because your girlfriend, that smile. He goes, what about her? I go, she didn't like me. She goes, you didn't like her either. I said, well, let's just say we didn't really hit it off. He goes, no, you didn't. I could tell that. But she told me to go through a treatment with you. I go, why? He says, my girlfriend had never seen sneakers that white. So as I was treating him, and talking to him, she was looking me up and down. And I do have very white sneakers. I always wear white sneakers. It's a signature move in our office. Everybody has white sneakers. And if they get dirty, we buy new ones. I keep three pairs of sneakers in the office. One I wear, and I have two on the second floor. And when one gets dirty, I just toss them, and I, and I put the other one on. So I immediately do that. So do my staff. You're not allowed to wear your sneakers out of the office. You have to keep them in the office. So we have lockers. So we keep them white. People look at that. We ended up placing some implants. These are old implants, the he external hex, old case. This is what we call the Swedish flying denture. And, um, you know, here he is at the at the end of treatment. And he ended up coming to my wedding. And she went and came into my office, too, for a full mouth rehabilitation. So when my sneakers get a little dirty like this, I put on a new pair like that. And everybody in the office wears those. So people are watching you. They're watching you. Yes, you're watching your patients. They're also watching you. And if you look at this, you're looking at... You know, your hair, your clothes, your fingernails, your teeth, are you clean shaven, and your sneakers. It's the little things that you're not even aware of that are happening. 
And I call it being quietly canceled. Patients may not say, oh, I'm not coming back here because I don't like your sneakers, but they just may not be coming back. You just don't know what's happening. These are what I call the little things, the little things that are happening all the time that we don't see. You know, in a situation like this, the little thing is there's a light bulb out here, but does anyone going to notice that besides me? It's important that we notice all the little things. Now, well, you can't control all the little things because you don't work for yourself now, but a lot of them you can control. And you certainly can control this, the service that you give. And this is a great book on service. It's the number one best-selling book on hospitality by Will Gadara, who now owns Levis and Madison Park, which was the number one restaurant in the world. And it was owned by um, Danny Myers, and he sold it to Will Gadara. When, it's a great story about hospitality and culture. And what you want to do with your patients is always be there to be the gift, to be playful, to be yourself, and to treat everybody uniquely. Be present in all of your interactions. Try to, what I like to do is be the gift to my patients. Because when patients are looking at you, they're not, they're not, I'm sorry about this, I'm having a little trouble by this. They're looking at, they're listening to the words, they're listening to your voice, but they're really looking at you. They're looking at what you look like. I mean, I talked a lot in the last hour or so. You don't remember much of my words, but you can see some pictures and you're getting a feel for it, the tone of it. It's basically what people see. That's what they remember. It's not what they hear. A lot of people say, well, this is what I said. Well, I didn't hear that. I have that conversation with people all the time. I told you that, but that's not what I heard, especially if you're married. You'll hear that all the time. And I tell my wife, I go, if you're going to tell me something, please send me an email if it's important, because then you have a written copy of it. I mean, I, I, I say that tongue in cheek, but some of it's true. You know, if we have a, you know, if we have plans to go out two weeks from now, please send me an email so I know not to book something else. This is my bathroom. My bathroom is beautiful. And we we have a sign there saying we take pride in keeping our clinic clean for our valued patients and guests. It's, this facility is not tip top uh, condition. Alert team members. I stole this from Disney. But we have a beautiful bathroom. It's the nicest room in our in our office. We try to give every patient a wow experience. And my favorite restaurant is actually Gramercy Tavern in New York City. And we have eaten there as a team three different times. This year we had the back room and we do an over-the-top experience. And this is our us at the Gramercy Tavern with my team. And this is owned by Danny Myers. And Danny Myers is my idol in, in customer service. And this book, Setting the Table, is the Bible. If you show any great restaurateur and mention him, they will know who Danny Meyer is. Uh, in your part of the, the world, Matt, my favorite restaurant is Frasca in Boulder. And mm -hmm. that's owned by Bobby Stuckey. And Bobby's a friend of mine. He's also giving thing. I've been to Frasca restaurant 30 times, and it's 2,000 miles from where I live. It's a phenomenal place. And he gives over-the-top service. Mm -hmm. Now, there are 8,700 restaurants in New York City, but at one point, Danny Meyers had three of the top 30. That is amazing. And we take our team to New York every year and we go to one of these restaurants. We've been to most of them with my team, except for 11 Madison Park. And we take the team on boat rides. We take them around the Statue of Liberty. We do a big deal. We take them to Broadway plays. We try to really build up the team. And what Danny Myers says, and this is, he says in, in the beginning of his book, that you may think, as I once did, that I'm in the primary business of serving food. Change the word food to dentistry. Actually, though, dentistry is secondary to something that matters even more. In the end, what matters most is creating meaningful, positively uplifting outcomes for human experiences and human relationships. Business like life is how you make people feel. How do you make your patients feel? And then he goes on and says, it's that simple and it's that hard. It's really, really simple to do that, but it does take time and it is not easy to do that consistently. It's the little things. And Danny Myers, when he rang the stock exchange bell, you know, when he when state when Shake Shack went public. You know, he, his net worth went to over $600 million. He wouldn't have been there unless he was that guy. But he doesn't act like that guy. You can talk to him. He's down to earth. He came here blurred from my book. I mean, that's amazing. And one one year I wanted to meet Danny. And I asked, I, I went to this, this restaurant here. It's called The Modern. It's the only Michelin star restaurant in a uh, museum in the world. So this is the MoMA Museum in New York City. And I, I took a couple of my staff members. I said, you know, do you want to go back back to the, to the kitchen? So I went up to the, the chef. I go, can I come back? He goes, sure. And he brings it into the kitchen. And I found that I can go into the kitchen at any great restaurant that feels really good about what they, the service they give. Will you allow your patients to go in your back room into your kitchen to look at what you do, to see your sterilization stuff? So I said to Danny, I called Danny up and I said, can, can you meet us there? And I hadn't met Danny at the time. And uh, they said, no, he's going to be out of town. So I'm back in this room with my staff and the maitre d' walks in and he hands me a copy of Danny Meyer's book. Now, Danny Meyer now has, okay, I mean, he must have 
a few thousand restaurants and he's a billionaire and he's got relationships all over the world. But he took the time to give me a handwritten book because he wasn't going to be there. And he wrote to me, Michael, here's to the power of hospitality in restaurants and then don't share. Who does that? How many billionaires are going to take the time to do that? I didn't know him at the time. And he gave me a blurb. I still don't know him. He's, he's that kind of a guy that reaches out. It means that much to him. And I was giving some advice to a young orthodontist yesterday who I refer a lot of cases to. But my cases are hard. They're not the easy children's cases where you lamp the teeth. And he just said, you know, Mike, I'm the Peter Donaldson town is starting to refer to me. He goes, I appreciate your referrals, but this is what I really want, the volume. And I said to him, I said, Matt, I said, I, I hear what you're saying. You're going to make more money from his patients than mine. But every patient that comes in, whether it's a big case, a little case, requires a little bit of work or a lot, you have to treat them with the same respect and have the same dignity for that patient. Because if you lose that, then you will no longer be great. Okay, so whether you're buying one membrane from you or you're buying 10,000 membranes for you, you have to treat those patients the same, the same customers the same way. And it's that way with patients. And I'll, I'll end with quoting Atal Gawande. You know, we've been wrong that our job is medicine. He's talking about physicians. We think our job is to ensure health and survival. But really, it's larger than that. It's to enable well-being. And well-being is larger than that. Well-being is about the reasons one wishes to be alive. Those reasons matter not just at the end of our life or when debility comes, but all along the way. It's about encouraging well-being amongst yourself and amongst your patients. You have to be healthy. You want to keep your patients healthy. And here's my final gift to you. If you take a picture of this, you'll get the first, uh, you can get the preview of my online series of videos. I have a three and a half hour series of lectures with notes and a workbook that can take you through this process and uh, help you learn some of these 